The following is an MDTV presentation. Welcome to Cardiology Today, the TV journal of cardiovascular medicine. It's estimated that more than 90% of the population afflicted with cardiac and vascular problems are cared for by their own primary care physician. To help keep you current, we shall explore the minds of the world's foremost authorities in cardiovascular medicine. We'll observe the most modern uses of their technology and report new developments from our nation's centers of cardiovascular research. So join us each month as we bring you a new dimension in physician continuing education. Cardiology Today. This is the second program in our three-part series on the cardiomyopathies. In our first program, we discussed the dilated cardiomyopathies, and today we're going to focus on the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. Our guests are Dr. Bill Roberts, Chief of Pathology at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in Bethesda, Clinical Professor of Pathology and Medicine at Georgetown University, and Editor-in-Chief of the prestigious American Journal of Cardiology. Our other distinguished guest is Dr. Walter Henry, Chief of Cardiology at the University of California at Irvine, and widely known as a pioneer in the clinical and research applications of echocardiography. Gentlemen, welcome back to Cardiology Today. Thanks. Bill, I'd like to begin with your description of the pathological features of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. Well, Vince, the heart with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is quite different from the heart with dilated cardiomyopathy and maybe the best way to appreciate the difference is to contrast the two. Hyper <coughs> hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is characterized by very small ventricular cavities whereas in dilated cardiomyopathy the cavities are quite large. One can feel the outside of a heart of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for example and get no sensation of a cavity. The problem with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is blood has a difficult time going from the atria into these very small ventricles. And then when the ventricles contract, they super contract. They put out too much blood uh, too quickly. The heart sort of works against itself. In dilated cardiomyopathy, in contrast, the, the ventricles beat very poorly. Um, so a lot of blood stays over uh, in, the, in the ventricular cavities after ventricular systole. Now because the cavities are, are small in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there's not enough room for that mitral valve, which really resides within the left ventricular cavity, uh, to, to, uh, to move properly. So what happens is that the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve uh, contacts 
the mural endocardium of the ventricular septum. As a consequence of that, the anterior mitral leaflet gets thickened and the mural endocardium in the uh, left ventricular outflow tract uh, gets thickened. The, the, when those two um, come together, uh, often obstruction uh, occurs, which Walter, I'm sure, will discuss later. Because the uh, blood has a difficult time getting from the atria into the ventricles, uh, the atrial cavities dilate. They dilate far more uh, than they do in dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, a problem with dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, the presence of these thrombi within the ventricles, that doesn't occur in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because uh, the ventricles put out uh, uh, all of the blood virtually uh, in that cavity with, with each beat. What is the cause of, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, Vince, as you know, nobody knows for sure uh, the cause. Um, I put uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the category of congenital heart disease because this is a condition uh, which is present, I suspect, in most patients from the time of birth. Uh, we've seen, for example, fatal hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in a two-week-old child, a month-old child. We've also seen this condition in, in patients uh, uh, over 80. So it is in a broad spectrum. It's also apparent, of course, that this condition runs in families. Uh, uh, some, we've seen one family at NIH, uh, there were five children and, and four of them died suddenly from this condition. Uh, so it's a, uh, a, a familial uh, tendency. Walter, let's talk for a minute about the hemodynamic consequences of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Well, Vince, that the uh, hemodynamic consequences can be quite variable. Uh, I think it's, it, we should emphasize that the primary problem, as Bill has emphasized, is that the ventricular septum is quite thick and uh, to a variable degree the left ventricular wall as well. Uh, this produces uh, a stiff ventricle and as a result uh, these patients have elevated uh, filling pressures, particularly the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. In addition, the thickening uh, will uh, impinge on the ventricular cavity, uh, producing a small left ventricular cavity which in turn produces a reduced stroke volume. Uh, that is uh, present particularly in the non-obstructed form of the disease. There are other uh, individuals, however, who in addition to those problems have a pressure gradient between the body of the left ventricle and the left ventricular outflow tract uh, due to the anterior lethal of the mitral valve coming forward, contacting the ventricular septum and systole and essentially creating a membrane between the body of the left ventricle and the aorta. Uh, in those individuals, the uh, pressure gradient uh, may be variable. For example, under basal circumstances, the gradient may be present, and by simply elevating the legs of an individual, you may uh, reduce the pressure gradient. Uh, there is a third general category of patients, and these are individuals who do not have resting obstruction, have a stiff ventricle that fills poorly, but in contrast to the other two groups, they develop uh, a pressure <coughs> gradient during certain types of provocative maneuvers. Uh, the provocative maneuvers that can create those gradients uh, are, for instance, a Valsalva maneuver, straining to lift a heavy object, uh, or uh, simply assuming the upright uh, posture uh, may also bring out a gradient that is not present when the individual is lying supine. Thank you, Walter. We'll be back in one minute. <laughs> We're continuing our discussion of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy.
Walter, how do patients with uh, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy usually present to the physician clinically? Well, the presentation events can be very uh, variable. Uh, some individuals are asymptomatic and are uh, picked up simply as part of a study of families of an individual who has known hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, other individuals will present predominantly with evidence of left heart failure, and this will include symptoms of dyspnea on exertion, fatigue and weakness, and in extreme situations, uh, orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Uh, chest pain may also be a presenting uh, symptom in these individuals. The chest pain may be typical exertional angina pectoris, or it may be a rather atypical kind of pain, and I've seen that frequently in individuals. Uh, chest pain not exertional, lasting for longer or shorter periods of time than typical angina pectoris. Uh, another way they may present is with dizziness, and in some instances, frank syncope. Uh, in most uh, circumstances, uh, this is due to the arrhythmias that these uh, patients have. And uh, finally, uh, patients may have a combination of all these symptoms to uh, a varying uh, a degree. In terms of the uh, physical findings, uh, that also is quite variable, and in some, uh, some people refer to this as the great masquerader of cardiology. Uh, the non-obstructed patients may have few physical findings with only a fourth heart sound and occasionally a, a mitral regurgitation murmur, although that's uncommon. Uh, they may have displacement of the point of maximal impulse, but otherwise have relatively unimpressive findings. Uh, the patients that have been easy to pick up in the past are the ones with murmurs. Uh, typically, the murmur of a patient with a resting gradient is a systolic uh, crescendo, decrescendo murmur present at the lower left sternal border and radiating into the axilla. Uh, that murmur typically does not uh, radiate into the carotids. Uh, in feeling the peripheral pulse of these individuals, the pulse may be uh, quite uh, striking and quite forceful and even have a bifid character and can be confused with patients with aortic regurgitation. However, when you listen to those individuals, instead of hearing a murmur of aortic regurgitation, you hear the systolic ejection murmur that sounds like aortic stenosis. Uh, in fact, uh, if one looks at the uh, carotid pulse tracings in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, clearly the carotid uh, pulse is bifid. In contrast, the patient with aortic stenosis has a much slower upstroke and a delayed to pulse, which is of uh, small volume. I know that the echocardiogram is the most useful test, but there are other diagnostic procedures that, that we use to evaluate these patients, so tell us about them. Well, we use the full armamentarium of uh, our uh, evaluation capabilities, including the electrocardiogram. Uh, the uh, EKG is usually abnormal, but it is uh, frequently nonspecific. There may be T ST T wave changes, there may be evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy, and what can particularly cause confusion is the presence of Q waves, which can uh, suggest the patient has had a previous myocardial infarction, when in fact the patient has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, instead. The uh, chest x-ray uh, may show a marked cardiomegaly or only minimal changes, and in fact patients with quite significant thickening may have only uh, minimal abnormalities on the uh, chest x-ray. Uh, the echocardiogram has indeed turned out to be extremely useful. In the uh, normal echocardiogram, uh, one can see the right ventricular cavity, the ventricular septum, the left ventricular free wall, and the posterior leaflet, or, or the, or the uh, posterior wall of the left ventricle. Uh, the key thing here is that the ventricle is uh, normal in size, is contracting normally, and that the septum and free wall are not thickened and are equal in size to each other. In the patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we can again see on this image the right ventricle, the septum, the left ventricular cavity and free wall. What strikes you here is the marked thickening of the ventricular septum in these individuals. They may also have left atrial enlargement as well. In some patients, the degree of septal thickening is striking. In, uh, as an example, the m echocardiogram uh, that we are examining here uh, shows a markedly thickened ventricular septum that in this instance is between four and five centimeters and nearly equal in size to the internal dimension of the left ventricle. What's particularly interesting about this uh, echocardiogram is the individual was asymptomatic and was 14 years old uh, despite this marked degree of ventricular uh, septal thickening. Uh, another important point on echocardiography is the motion of the mitral valve. In the normal individual, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve does not move forward during systole and does not narrow the left ventricular outflow tract. In the patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, however, 
the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve moves forward and contacts the ventricular septum and systole, and that finding is characteristic of the obstructed patients. In other individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the mitral valve does not move forward in systole, and these pa patients are the ones who do not have gradients between the body of the left ventricle and the left ventricular outflow tract. In terms of the uh, mechanism of this, uh, most people feel that it's due to a venturi phenomenon causing the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve to come forward and contact the ventricular septum during systole, producing outflow obstruction, and in addition, creating the presence of mitral regurgitation. Hemodynamically, the uh, uh, tr uh, tracings in the cath lab can show a pressure gradient between the body of the left ventricle and the aorta. That pressure gradient changes during premature uh, ventricular contractions. And geographically, these patients have small, and, uh, small ventricles with thick walls. Thank you, Walter. We'll be back in one minute. We're discussing the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. Bill, what are the complications of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathies? Well, obviously there are many events. The major one, uh, of course, is death. Uh, and this com frequently comes in the, in the mode of sudden. Uh, Dr. Barry Marin and I, uh, a few years ago, looked at uh, a number of competitive athletes who died suddenly. All of these patients were, people were under age uh, 35, and we found that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was the most common cause of sudden death uh, among them. Other complications uh, include uh, varying types of arrhythmias, of course, uh, and the sudden death almost surely is due to uh, an arrhythmia. Uh, the dilatation of the atria, which can be quite striking in these individuals, is often associated with the development of atrial arrhythmias which can be uh, quite dangerous because of the loss of that atrial kick, trying to get blood into that very small cavity. Another complication rarely recognized clinically is myocardial infarction. And we found that 15% of the patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy studied at autopsy have transmural left ventricular scars. Now, none of the patients that we have studied have had that diagnosis established during life because, as Walter has mentioned, the electrocardiograms are virtually always abnormal. And to pick up electrocardiographic changes of ischemia is uh, uncommon. Uh, heart block, uh, conduction disturbances may also occur. And we've seen uh, some patients uh, at autopsy who during life had uh, a good deal of pulmonary hypertension. It's almost like mitral stenosis. Sometimes it's very difficult to get blood into that left ventricular cavity and pulmonary venous pressures go up and then uh, pulmonary arterial pressures. Walter, how do we approach these patients with our medical therapy? What do we have to offer? Well, Vince Beta blockers may be useful both in the non-obstructed as well as the obstructed patients although it's, uh, probably its primary benefit is in the individuals with uh, resting gradients. Um, most of the evidence seem to su seems to suggest that beta-blocking drugs do not affect the resting gradient very much, but they do blunt the increase in gradient that occurs with certain types of things, such as exercise. So we use uh, beta-blocking drugs to hopefully allow these individuals to exercise uh, more uh, with uh, less symptoms. I would uh, point out several 
uh, features of the use of beta blocking drugs. First, they tend to be used in fairly large doses, uh, and it's not unusual to be up to a dose of 320 milligrams per day in an individual. Uh, my experience has also been, however, that many people who are started on beta blocking drugs have some minor improvement in chest pain, but may have substantial worsening in congestive symptoms, particularly feelings of fatigue and weakness. And uh, frequently, I've been confronted with a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on beta blockers, have reduced their uh, beta blocking dose or stopped it entirely and found the patient was improved symptomatically rather than worsened. Other uh, drugs we use are calcium channel blockers, and that's uh, now a new type of drug that is just now being used to treat uh, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy probably will be especially useful in the non-obstructive patients. I would point out that digen diuretics may actually worsen the symptoms of these individuals and should be used with great caution. And finally, emphasize the point that Bill made that we should by all means keep these patients in sinus rhythm, treat atrial fibrillation very vigorously, try to prevent it from occurring if we can pharmacologically. You would treat the atrial fibrillation with a beta blocker rather than with digitalis to control the rate? Yes, I would, and there's some work that's now uh, starting to come out suggesting that amiodarone, for example, uh, may be helpful in uh, preventing these patients from going into atrial fibrillation. That should be considered uh, still a somewhat experimental approach, however. Mm -hmm. Bill, what does surgery have to offer these patients? A great deal, I think, uh, Vince. Um, at NIH, uh, through the years, uh, beginning with uh, Dr. Eugene Braunwall and uh, Dr. Uh, Steve Epstein later, over 1,300 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have been followed through the years. Approximately 400 of them have undergone operation. The most common procedure done is referred to now as the Morrow procedure introduced by uh, Dr. Glenn Morrow, and that consists of splitting uh, the ventricular septum or and or taking out some of the muscle, usually both. And this has been a wonderful procedure in regard to elimination of the gradient and also elimination of, of the symptoms uh, uh, almost always. Uh, the mortality for the operation has remained about 8%. Whether or not the procedure will actually uh, uh, prolong life is not yet established, but clearly from the patient's standpoint, it's been wonderful for uh, eliminating symptoms. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Walter. I'll return one minute with our summary. Let's take a minute to summarize our discussion on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This condition is often present from birth and frequently is familial. Patients may be asymptomatic or present with symptoms of left heart failure, chest pain, dizziness, or syncope. Sudden death may also occur. The examination commonly reveals a fourth heart sound, a systolic murmur, and a strikingly forceful arterial pulse. 
The ECG is usually nonspecific, but may show Q waves resembling the pattern of a previous myocardial infarction. Diagnosis is best made with the echocardiogram. The treatment of choice is with beta blockers, although calcium channel blockers are also useful. Digitalis and diuretics may worsen the condition. Finally, cephalomyotomy or myectomy is very effective in patients failing to respond to medical therapy. This concludes the second program in our series on the cardiomyopathy. Please join us in our next program where we will discuss the infiltrative cardiomyopathies. Until then, thank you for joining us.